Um, I'm Sergeant Kevin Mishik, I'm part of the partnership prevention team that works in the city. I have geographical responsibility for the northern half of the city, so everything north of the river, what historically was the, um, the west area, which is one of this major part of this committee, is now covered by being as it historically was. Um, and as Sergeant Nigel Leadbeater, he's not here this evening, but he covers the, uh, the market board. So, um, this report has been um, populated by the pair of us, so I will now go through what it says. Um, talking about, we'll go through this continuation of licensed premises enforcement visits. Um, this is carried on. Premises are, are routinely visited, there's been no breaches of conditions or any concerns at this time. The key venues are all monitored by the licensing officer and scored according to the Cardiff model. Um, does everyone know what the Cardiff model is? Uh, if it does good, it gets some plus points. If it does bad things, it gets some minus points. And essentially, it's, a, very, it's much more complicated than that, but that's the long and short of it. It's a way of monitoring which, which, which premises are becoming problematic. Um, the second priority was the violent, um, violent crime in the city centre. Um, we have dedicated resources um, which run an intelligence-led operation towards issues in the city centre, which is part of called Operation Connect. And again, the Cardiff model helps us identify and engage with locations which are identified drop spots. So rather than just wandering around the pieces of the city that look nice, we actually go to the places where historically information suggests there's going to be an issue. Okay, the third one was traffic junction enforcement and general road safety for normal users. Um, the staff and the partnership prevention team continue to work hard to ensure that all road users are using the road appropriately. This work was carried out in a number of ways. There's been work, uh, been work on being on foot and in vehicle patrols in areas aggressive across the city. The city centre team are particularly key in this work carrying out patrols at the key locations in the city centre, a number of which have been mentioned here today. And I'm sure if you were to speak to the officers in the city centre, they are well aware of where it is. And I personally find it exceptionally hard to walk through the city centre without having at least seven or eight conversations with the sergeant. Um, again, suffering from inappropriate cycling. As well as working with Sabri, there's been similar support from the Evergreen Community Speedwatch team, um, which is now proven extensively across the city. But, as always, if anyone else wants to join, please uh, let us know. I have a very nice piece here, so we'll come and show you how, the, uh, how it works and uh, what you can do with it. It's a very impressive piece of kit. Cycle theft. We've continued to tackle cycle theft across the city. Um, during the recording period, there's been a number of reports of cycle crime, and a large number of these have been linked to students and staff of various colleges across the area. Uh, there's been a key individual who's been responsible for a significant amount of this theft. He keeps cutting his hair, not realising that he still looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a joke. And they go, this is you? And he goes, no, it's not. I go, it's not. <laughs> that's you. No, it's not. Well, that's him. Um, he's been to prison. He's come out of prison. He's probably going back to prison. So, um, as well as working around the specific offenders who are obviously quite problematic, um, we are working at hot, key hotspot locations. Um, we have done some uh, cycle market events and the like. I don't think any of those have been on the west of the city, but they've been aimed at places where there are large amounts of bikes. So it's something potentially we could look at. And we are still trying to get community um, behaviour, criminal behaviour. Real community, community behaviour, criminal behaviour. Thank you, sir. Um, against this young gentleman with conditions around him and his bikes and him going to university land and the like. So um, that's where we are. Um, the next one is tackling rough sleeping in the city centre. Um, the city centre officers and our street lock officer continue to work with the partner agents to provide support and diversion for payments to people who are rough sleeping. The city council has a strategy which includes information cards detailing where they can obtain assistance and which officers can share with the rough sleepers. So that's, that work's still ongoing. Um, this is a very long report. Um, <laughs> glad I didn't um, tackling drug dealing in the city centre Arbury and Castle Ward. I know that Arbury is actually in the north of the city, but it does butt up to Castle, so it's not a major issue. Work is continued in the area to address the drug supply within Cambridge. Work care that takes place based on intelligence gathered by officers to target the most vulnerable people in our communities who allow their homes to be used to supply Class A drugs. Parts of the prevention team have carried out a range of enforcement action, which has led to a number of people being charged with relevant offences regarding the sale of Class A drugs. A number of people are currently on bail whilst are completed. And as well as the work to deal with the people who supply drugs, we work, we continue to work with a wider, wider number of support agencies to support those people who are using and trying to stop them and make positive changes in their lives. Um, 
that work again is very much driven by the, the constabulary's opinion of looking at the threat, risk and harm of an issue. So our enforcement action is based around making sure that if people are being um, what's the word? exploited and having their property used, that's, that is where our enforcement action is targeted. Uh, and last but not least, um, theft from vehicles in Newham. There's been a number of thefts from vehicles over the reported period, and most of these have been from builders' vans in the area. Um, the patrols have been carried out in the area. The Reverend mentioned advice has been passed not only the van owners themselves, but the people that were having a building were carried out. These issues are similar to other areas in the city, and most notably the south of the city, where there are a large number of tradesmen working. So basically, when there's lots of people working, there's lots of vans being broken into. We have um, our investigation department have written a extensive patrol plan which is um, carried out by not only our teams but also supported by the wider policing teams across the city. Or a board, is that lots of questions? Yes, well I have a question. I couldn't work out why it appears that January to May shows a rise everywhere. Right. And January to May, or? Yeah. Yes. Do you want me to answer this? Okay. It's, 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 it's everywhere. This is, not just, this is not just the Western City, this is one on the North Rider Reading. Yes. And when I looked at the figures, it was across the whole fort, so I'm making it possible. Yes. Uh, I, I was asked about this earlier, and we've been looking at it. Uh, what we've seen is an increase in crime generally, not just in the city centre and west areas, but across Cambridge City across the force, across England and Wales. And what, looking a bit more deeply into the issue, seems to be behind it, is much tighter crime recording standards. And we're recording a lot of things as crimes, uh, where it's on the balance of probabilities a crime has taken place, whereas previously we may not have been as tight at recording that. And the reason we're trying to make sure that recording is really tight is about crime data integrity, and it's about making sure that that crime data is accurate, um, and, and previously, um, perhaps if we may have turned up at an incident where uh, outside of pub people have been pushing and shoving each other, and the officers might have used a more pragmatic pragmatic approach and just sent people on their way and made sure that the violence and disorder had finished. Now if six people have pushed and shoved each other, we'll record six crimes of assault. Um, so figures have gone up and to try and make sure that it, there isn't an underlying issue around an actual increase in serious violence. Um, as chair of the alcohol related violent crime group, I've, I've looked into the, the figures in the city centre and what we've seen is that actually assaults with injury, which are the most serious assaults, have actually decreased. Assaults without injury, which would tend to be the lower level assaults where it is people pushing and shoving each other, have gone up. Um, which would tend to support our hypothesis that it's around tight to crime recording standards. We've also looked at the Adam Brooks A&E data about people going into Adam Brooks and they've been assaulted and the ambulance pickup data for the city both of those show a reduction in people being picked up or going to A&E from the city who are reporting having been assaulted. Um, so we think that is what it's about, it's about type of crime recording standards. We also, like I said, we take third party reports now. I did, when I wrote this report, and I wrote the North one report in about two days later, I, the North, because it has a heavier amount of crime, it's a bigger area, it's kind of quite a noticeable thing, so I checked Peterborough's numbers, saw as the boss says they were the same, and suddenly, didn't feel like the Armageddon was coming and it was, uh, I'm sure you mentioned Armageddon in the church. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, I'm oh, sorry. Um, one of the most shocking things in this report, in the policing report, in the, in the environmental data report, it says that the number of needles cleaned up by the environmental team has risen, risen from six last year to 476 in more market wards this year. Now perhaps that's insignificant and someone's just dropped 400 needles which are clean and it's, it's a coincidence, but it looks extremely worrying considering all the, um, the issues with drug dealing and the... I haven't noticed well. an increase in the amount of intravenous drug use going on. Um, six just seems amazingly low. 
Um, I don't know whether they've started importing things differently, and it's not a question of having answered to it. But if you look at the fact of saying, have I noticed that yeah. oh, there's Wendy, Wendy, I don't know. I don't know. Would you like can we move on to the next question then? Yes. Before Wendy arrives, or do you want to wait for Wendy to get? I think all these ones. Right. Right. Well, maybe we'll just the in Wendy's section then. My, my question is really, if, if is there a, an increase in drug dealing? Do you think that the no. government... No, I, 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 I don't think there's... That would be a, oh my word, my maths is not good on a Wednesday evening, but that would be a significantly catastrophic change, and there simply hasn't been... But no, it just, it just it's not going to happen. Thanks. I wanted to ask a question about um, enforcement and uh, policing of traffic. Um, going back uh, earlier on this year, a um, statement on enforcement says, as it recurs into community speed watch operations on certain roads, traffic data boxes are employed to check on average speeds. And I did notice, I think probably a couple of months ago, when it made its causeway, I noticed a number of them around the town. I don't know whether that's to do with the city deal or whether these are police traffic data boxes, but they do. Um, the police used to publish the, um, the data from these data boxes, which are in place for often quite a considerable period of time, on their website. They no longer do so. There are no figures available. So how are, um, how are average speeds uh, made available? Are they actually measured anywhere? Well, I can't answer that. That's not the decision that, I'm, that I make, and that's made outside of the, the team I work on. I can't answer that question. Do you know if they use traffic data boxes? Um, I know that our speed watch team, the community speed watch team, they have that equipment, but I don't have anything to do with that. So, unless the boss makes more than me, it's, it's outside our remit. Yeah, we can find out the answer to that for you. Uh, the, the team who now come out to do the speed monitoring in locations are a Triforce collaborated team. Um, so, we collaborated with Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire. They do still come out and do monitoring of average speeds and locations, but I'm not sure exactly which locations they've been to recently and what the results of those were. So we, we can try and find out for you because I, I know the council also do a lot of the monitoring in areas. Um, so the fact the box was there doesn't necessarily mean it was ours, but we can find out for you and report back at the next area committee meeting. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that, but they're not published on your website, so we don't have any public access to these figures. They used to be going back several years, I've archived them, but that's no, that's no, no little interest for figures, you know, a number of years ago. Um, so, uh, I would... That's quite possibly because it's now the collaborated team, so they may be on a different website. Again, I'll try and find out for you and provide... A, go through the, the City Council to send out a link to the website if we find where that information now is. That would be very useful because I have no, I cannot get any information on um, uh, the results of any traffic enforcement because it's done on this Triforce basis. The figures don't seem to be available, that I've been told that figures aren't available because of that, which means it's very hard to know any of what enforcement has been, is, is actually taking place around the city of uh, 20 mile an hour because we just don't, the figures don't seem to be available. So how, what, when, when the police are asked to look at 20 mile an hour enforcement, we don't know what is being done. There are only vague remarks about, oh, well, we look at it on a regular basis, etc., etc. But we don't have any figures, at, we can't say. At, at the moment, because uh, I want to be completely open and, and transparent about the situation, uh, there is not enforcement, um, people being issued with tickets around the 20 mile an hour limits, the 20 mile an hour limits, uh, that's where we're encouraging the use of community speed watch and part, uh, part of the issue is around the speed monitoring as well and the average speed monitoring is also looking at the proportionality of enforcement around 20 mile an hour speed limits because what we, we need to make sure following ACPO guidance that actually the street and road environment is such that the 20 mile an hour speed limit is suitable so it's proportionate for us to enforce. Um, so. In yes, terms of enforcement, the reality will be uh, that there will be very few, if any, drivers having been prosecuted recently 
for exceeding the 20 mile an hour limits is something we're actively looking at at the minute, but we need to make sure that action is proportionate. I've been banging on about this issue for six years, since Meds Causeway in August 2010 had a 20 mile limit in, in, installed. And I think there's only one instance where I've actually felt that, that, that a really good a bit of enforcement took place, but that was only for a 30 limit, when a 20 limit was actually in force. Yeah. Uh, uh, because the police were looking at education. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and the police say community speed watch, speed watches, education is not enforcement, so the police aren't doing any enforcement. But ACPO did actually, uh, ACPO did write to the parliamentary group on cycling and say, when drivers are regularly and willfully breaking the law, they will be prosecuted. Uh, so that is happening, I can tell you, in Maine's Causeway on a regular basis. Speeds on there are frequently uh, well above the 20 limit, but since we don't have any figures from any traffic monitoring, I don't think the police actually enforce it on a particular road. When the traffic's moving freely, traffic speeds can be quite high. But I don't seem to have any hope, even reading this guidance from ACPO, that any enforcement is ever going to take place. This is six years down the line. Well, what, what, what we're trying to satisfy us is, is that <clears throat> when it comes to the 20 mile an hour limit, we're actually not just relying on enforcement to try and get drivers to drive at 20 miles an hour because just imposing a 20 mile an hour limit and suddenly expecting everyone to drive at 20 miles an hour isn't necessarily going to work unless there are physical improvements that are made that are referred to in the ACPO guidance and other things done to try and encourage driver behaviour to, to reduce yeah, their well, I'm aware of that. I have yeah, read the so, guidance. So just relying on police enforcement is, is very difficult because we don't have the capacity, as I've said, at other area committee meetings to just be out all the time enforcing 20 mile an hour limits and we need to work with our partners in the council and highways to try and make sure that actually we're looking at the wider issue and I'm sorry, getting but, people to reduce this. The fact way. is nobody is going to remodel Mates Causeway because it's a major bus route. So we're left with a situation where I do I read this out from you from ACPO, where drivers are regularly and willfully breaking the law, we would expect the officers will enforce the limit and prosecute offenders. That's what ACPO have said to the old parliamentary group on cycling. And I do think that actually applies in the case of Men's Causeway because it's a wide road. When, when traffic is freely moving, the speeds are high. And when the officer for, who came from North Cambridgeshire, he had a police car, he hit me on the door with his light gun. And he measured traffic. He got a bus full of passengers that was breaking the 30 limit. Um, and he said plenty of people were breaking the 30 limit when the 20 limit was enforced. So I don't think that anybody is, has any discouragement in Mates Causeway from breaking, from not break, from, from abiding by the law. They have no encouragement to, to abide by the law because they know they can get away with it because I don't think that any enforcement is taking place. If you do some enforcement, the message will get around that you're doing some, but all we've ever had on the front page of this local newspaper is please not to enforce 20 limit. That is all we've ever had, not please to enforce 20 limit on an occasional basis. But no, it's always been negative, and this is the situation. I think we'll move on, I'm sure I'm all I mean, I think this is such Matter. And I think one of the problems with the traffic and highways, and I think Councillor Holt and myself experienced it when we were trying to deal with the passage of HGVs coming out of the I mean, which was utterly intolerable. One of the problems is the, um, the way the police force now, the responsibilities, and I think traffic and highways are Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire. I mean, when I got to the right people, we were able to get the right people in to enforce the HGVs and work with Highways Agency and um, Highways England. But there is a real problem of the geographical location. So for us sitting here, you know, trying to, you know, voicing our problems to PC Mizic, um, you know, it's quite understandable that he, he can't do this and what would be really helpful is to have some sort of, um, if we could just be given as councillors a simple list with who are the officers and which counties, which forces, Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire and what they're responsible for and 
how we can contact them easily in order to get enforcement. So that's just a suggestion for the next area committee. Thanks, Chair. Through you, um, the, the officer says that enforcement alone isn't enough to get the message out that people should be driving 20 miles an hour, but the, there doesn't seem to be enforcement. Actually, it seems as if the 20 miles an hour thing is advisory, and because it's a new scheme, the impression will, will strengthen among drivers that they don't really need to drive at 20 miles an hour. It's sort of a, a funny thing that they do in cities in some places. It, it's been put in place for a reason to try and bring speeds down to make the road safe. And actually, we're, we're trying to encourage a major modal shift towards cycling and walking. And the cyclists are afraid to go on the road because they get bullied by cars whizzing along. This happens all the time on Maid's Causeway and Mill Road. You, you're frightened when you cycle along there by cars who think, oh, I can get through these lights if I just put my, put my foot down. It's, it's endemic. And then the cyclists move on to pavements, and then the pedestrians are afraid because the cyclists are driving around on pavements. If the roads were just enforced to, to make the 20 miles an hour limit, a 20 miles an hour limit, it would do so much good for, for the safety of the city. In terms of the desired outcome of traffic, travelling more slowly at 20 miles an hour on inappropriate roads, I fully support that. What I'm concerned about is that we've not properly thought through how we're going to get to that desired outcome. And just saying, well, we'll put a 20 mile an hour limit there and get the police to come along and try and enforce it um, is perhaps not the best way because there are some 20 mile an hour limits in the county and they are absolutely fantastic. They've been there for some time and actually the traffic goes really slowly and it's quite difficult to travel at more than 20 mile an hour in, in them. Um, and, and they're really effective. Uh, but we need to look more widely at how we're going to achieve that desired outcome and just, uh, there, is, there is research that has been done elsewhere that I've seen where if inappropriate speed limits are put on roads, actually what is found is that the average speeds on those roads increases because drivers just think, well, this is patently ridiculous and don't try and comply with any speed limit whatsoever. Um, and, and we've seen sort of evidence-based um, research into where that has happened. And I just want to make sure that we're not going to face the same sort of issue in the city and that, that we do think through how to get the traffic travelling more slowly where it needs to. CCTVs being put up around the city to replace the bollards for the core scheme. There may be more cameras appearing as part of the city deal scheme, whatever it comes up with in January. Are the police working with the county to try and make sure cameras are able to detect breaches of the 20 miles an hour limit to send the well, There don't currently have cameras that will do 20 mile an hour limits. You'd need um, two kinds of cameras to do yeah. that. You'd need a speed camera and you'd need a CTTV camera. They, they can't do the same. They can't do the same job. Colin, would you like to ask your question? I've got a related cycle safety issue, and that is a number of police forces around the country have started enforcing motor vehicles that don't leave enough space for cycles. But that is a non-trivial problem in Cambridge. Uh, and it starts with words of advice, but it's a matter where driver education and ultimately enforcement is needed for the safety of cyclists because there are, there are problems uh, with motor vehicles coming into contact with the cyclists simply because they go too close to them. And that has been recognised by a number of forces and, and taken up quite strongly. Uh, I'm not heard about it in Cambridge, we have a lot more cyclists here. Um, and we also have some drivers who behave terribly. I've been cut up by buses on a bike, for example. I've, if, you, if you stand at the New Market Road coming into town from the east. The number of motor vehicles turning left into East Road that indicate that they're doing so is a tiny proportion. So, and those are just examples of bad driver behaviour where an officer on his tea break could educate quite a few people. In defence of the officer on his tea break, he's on his tea break. <laughs> so the idea is when you have a break, you actually at work. Um, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, I'll have a look. I'll see if well, there's national units out there and see if there's anything that our um, uh, casualty reduction team or the um, 
we can put out along those lines. Please. <coughs> Thank you. Um, kind of related to speeding drivers, and I particularly noticed this down Emmanuel Street uh, when I'm waiting to catch buses fairly late at night following things like council meetings, um, is drivers who drive cars with illegally souped up engines. It's an issue I've raised before, it's something that I seem to be coming across more and more, and it is incredibly irritating. Now, the last time I raised it, I think it was a different area committee, um, I was told by one of your officers that um, so, uh, the modifications actually breach the law. And I actually got a tweet, I think, or a text from um, your headquarters saying um, there are specific breaches to the law relating to antisocial behaviour, but also potentially driving a car without insurance because the modifications that are made to the engines actually invalidate the insurance policies. So I just wondered what your procedures were with dealing with those motorists as they drive past with their incredibly loud engines um, in terms of stopping them being able to test them or requiring them to bring their cars into your facilities to have them tested so that you, know, you can get them off the road. Thank you. That, that will be the work carried out by our, our road police unit. That's what, they, that's what they do. Their job is to enforce that kind of stuff. Me and my officers don't spend enough time in cars to get behind anybody who draws like that to do that kind of work. We don't have that kind of expertise, so that will be something done by the road police unit. I'm wondering whether there's also potentially in part a technological solution to it, similar to where you have CCTV cameras, uh, um, safety cameras, um, just by having some sound monitors. Um, I mean, I spend half my time dealing with audio issues with this thing, um, and I'm just wondering whether there's any technology out there that you could just have small sound sensors by your, for example, some of your major road junctions, so that as soon as the car's set off, that's when they floor the accelerator and that's when they make the most noise. I think there's all kinds of issues about sound monitoring around junctions that I'd hate to get into the to get into in terms of what you might accidentally pick up. It's, it's, it's that kind of work with um, inappropriate vehicles and vehicles being used inappropriately like that sits with our local policing unit and they can do deal with things. It potentially invalidates insurance if you don't tell your insurance company you've done it. And there is potentially, if, the, if you have told your insurance company you've done it, then they'll just charge you more money. Well, right, and thank you. Sorry. I'm going to have just one more question. Um, could, could I raise the question at, um, in the report of, about rough sleeping, please? Yes. Um, we, we've learned recently that there is um, more than doubling of the extent of, of rough sleeping in the city, and a lot of that, I think I'm right in saying, is, is in the city centre. Um, three questions, really. Um, what is the what, how do you describe the police's role in helping with the situation? Uh, yeah. Secondly... Do you, want me, do you want to ask me and I'll answer? Because I'll, I'll ask you the three together. No, you do, I'll have forgotten the first question. No, you won't. No, you won't. They're very simple questions. Lovely. Um, one is, how do you see the role yeah. of the police in helping address this problem of rough sleeping? The second is, how you would see that changing given that the problem has doubled? And thirdly, um, there's a reference here to um, begging yes. and encouraging people yes. to give instead to charity, which is a, a very long-standing uh, oh, campaign yes. from the City Council and others, and very good. Um, but the question I wanted to ask in relation to that here was, how are the police actually addressing the begging itself? Right. Okay. Because that, I think, remains... Um, an offence. Oh yes, yes. And um, it, it would be interesting to understand how you see that being being tackled. Right. Okay. Question. <laughs> answer to question one. Um, I think it's important. Rough sleeping is dealt with holistically. In terms of there is a large amount of support and a large amount of other 
welfare agencies that go on there. Unfortunately, sometimes people don't want to engage and are potentially at the right point in their lives to do it. Um, I have for a long time viewed the role of the, uh, the police in this inquiry is the, the stick to the carrot. Play nicely with the street outreach team, they'll help you. Play nicely with the uh, people at, uh, across the way at uh, Willow Wharf and they'll help you. Talk to the council and they'll accommodate you. If you don't, come and play with us. And it's worked quite well for a number of years. Um, begging is still illegal, we take enforcement action and there are, I know Nigel's got his team out doing some plainclothes work around there. I don't want to, are you speaking about your project here? There is, the, the, the alternate giving scheme has been rebranded and now looks amazingly good, but that's capital's one. So the idea is, it's long and it's complicated, but you don't help somebody by giving them a pound sitting on the floor. You make them, you keep them homeless. So the idea is if you can find a way to get that good feeling and I want to help that person by giving them money appropriately, then you can help them rather than um, keep them where they are. Is that, is, is that about it? Is that... Um, yeah, I've got some information about that here. It's, um Cambridge Street Aid and it's a way of people being able to sort of lose change into somebody's hat to text a donation to a particular fund. Um, support workers working with individuals on the street can then apply into that fund for, for items that can help that person get off the street such as, um, well, it could be anything, it could be clothing, it could be um, assistance with uh, items for their hostel accommodation, training, anything that might help them move away from life on the streets. Um, so I've got some information about that here. Um, since it was launched on the 28th of November, we've had £1,300 donated, which I think is quite good. So that now sits in the fund, um, and people um, who have a street background can, you know, through a support work, can apply for that. So we're hoping eventually, longer term, we'll discourage people from giving directly to beggars. And maybe that will make Cambridge a less lucrative place for beggars to come. So... And just the question I wanted to ask is the council to say... Councillor Big still got question two in there. And I knew I'd forget the three. Yes. <laughs> That's we right. asked three and I knew I remembered one and I remembered three. Um, the police role. So you've, I think you've answered the question about the police role. Yes. I think you've answered pretty much the question about begging. But the question about the fact we've had such a dramatic increase in rough sleeping, how you see the police responding to the doubling of the, of the, the problem? The, the, the issue around prosecution of rough sleeping is a very political one and it's one we will not do. We have historically, in a specific case, of prosecuted rough sleeping and the response we got from the magistrate's court wasn't very positive and, yeah, not in a minute what, what happened there. Um, our role is very much to make people engage and to make them understand that the choice of disengaging from the support and just choosing to live on the streets and do nothing is probably not one it is. I think I've said to one of the council officers many times that Cambridge has a lot of toys in it. If you want to come and play with my toys, you have to play by my rules. If you want to come and live in the city and get the, the outstanding support that comes from Winter Comfort and the council and the street outreach team and all these people, great, come here, they'll help you, they'll help you, as um, Sarah says, they'll give you the money, they'll support you and they'll move you on. However, I have to come to work, I have to pay my mortgage and I have to pay my tax. If you come to Cambridge and stay here, you have to abide by the, the rule of the land and the rules of the city and that's kind of where we stand in the making sure that those people do. Also, there are issues around um, reconnection with people with who um, aren't here. We've done some work with the UK Border Agency around um, treaty rights and the like around that as well, which hopefully will have a reduction in the number of people who aren't rough sleeping, not rough sleeping, while A, reconnecting them, or B, pushing them into engagement and pushing them into moving their life in a more positive way. Does that answer the question? Well, it still doesn't really address, that says what you have been doing. Yeah. But now we can all see the problems doubled. Um, does that... Does that say the, that the something... The issue is the role of the Street Life Officer was historically funded by the City Council. Is this a question you're asking me? 
I'm asking you whether the, it's not going to be funded the, anymore. Whether, whether, they've, they've withdrawn the funding from the dedicated officer, um, and that is now a decision that I don't know the answer to. That is a decision that I don't know what the future will bring, <coughs> what it will hold. That is a conversation that Nigel will host the portfolio, the chief inspector, and the council need to have going forward. I don't know is the honest answer, um, but I think that's what we were driving towards, wasn't it? So the, the council at the moment are telling us that every penny that we give to their um, charitable um, appeal will be spent on rough sleeping and homelessness. Why can't they give us that same assurance about hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of public money being spent on rough sleeping and homelessness in the city? That's a council question. I'm a police officer. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't particularly addressing it. All right, I just thought we were doing police questions. That's yeah. why I'm slightly right, confused. It's in, the, it's in the policing item because this. All oh, right, fair enough. No good. I understand now. I was a little bit confused for a while. Um, thank you. Uh, it was to pick up on Tim's point about what, what actions you, um, as a police force, are able to take against rough sleepers in the city centre. I just wondered whether you have been working at all with the fire service on the potential fire risk that is posed by people sleeping on large quantities of cardboard in doorways. Um, we've worked with fire service around squatting previously, um, around obviously um, the appropriateness of where people are saying for potential fire risks and that as they have some fairly significant power around there. I must admit that's a really good idea that I hadn't thought of. Um, thank you. I, I, will, I will pass that on to Ben and that's certainly, I've always thought along the idea of a number of things about a couple but that's a new one and it's, um, I don't know, my work, worth a try. Right. I'm going to try and wind it up to yeah. please have a yes. quick a request because um, the Cambridge Street Aid Fund is there um, is it possible for people to simply walk in off the street into the Guild Hall into the main reception and make a donation? Do we have that facility? They, they, because it's all it's all managed so, by um, sorry, um, a second oh, sorry. a second and then the supplementary to that is that. This afternoon I was walking around the city centre and I came across two homeless young men um, looking for £12.50 to pay for their night shelter. You were shaking your head. No. As, as, sorry, I'm on housing scrutiny, so this really does concern me. And I know David Greening, the housing homeless strategy officer, is, is writing a report um, to brief us on what Tim Bix identified the rise in uh, homelessness but to me it seems if we if we had the access into the guild hall for residents simply to go to the main desk make a donation and then for those who need their 12 pounds 50 for the hostel or whatever that they should be able to go into the guild hall and at least register to access that service i'm simply asking is that possible the hostels cost nothing the hostels are free, that Sorry, is a tactic I, they I, use to beg for money. Um, I believe you can pay by text messages at all. Um, the street aid scheme is we don't handle the money. There's been several attempts at the alternative giving scheme before. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and the first attempt was where there was donation boxes. It was quite difficult to administer that money once it was collected, once it was <coughs> donated. This scheme takes that away. The Cambridgeshire Community Foundation are managing that fund on behalf of uh, the street aid. Street aid. Um, so if people want to donate money, they can do it by text, or they can go onto the Cambridgeshire Community Foundation website and do it by just giving. So there are other ways of doing it, but there won't be collection boxes at this stage. Because that, that adds a whole different element, we have to then collect that money and it, it makes it more complicated. And the second thing, for the homeless person to come in and register in the Guildhall, that was my second question, the homeless person to come into the Guildhall or some public point to say, I want to immediately access that fund. Is they, that possible? No, they need to go via their support worker. So we've been also giving out these cards to rough sleepers and beggars with the details, the places they can go to get information. So it's got the details of uh, Winter Comfort, Jimmy's, Police Station, City Council. So if they need support, they can come into the City Council. Street Outreach will go out and um, engage with them on the street to give them support. Um, what we find is, Quite often they don't want that support and they won't engage and they don't have to hand over any cash at the hospitals or at Jimmy's. So they don't need that £12.50 £12 .50 to get into Jimmy's. Um, I was going to ask a 
Can we have the text number for that? Yeah, I've got cards here. I'll leave them here for you. Right, okay. so, um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about... Um, it's not necessarily a police priority thing, because I think it's a bit too specific. But... Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Oh, it's not necessarily a police priority issue because I think it's a little too specific, but there has been, over the years, persistent um, parking in the mandatory cycle lane in Downing Street next to the Revolution Bar. And I'm aware that it isn't something that the civil enforcement officers can deal with. I can't remember why, but I'm aware that it isn't. And I think it's... Um, I'm wondering what action the police can take to offer maybe strong words of advice to the bar who I, allow them to park there and others who do that because it's a danger to cyclists and it's a danger to pedestrians because they block the path. I, I imagine the officers, if they see it, would do that. And I will have a conversation with Nigel to make sure his team's briefed on those ones. Thank you. Um, I'm going to wind up with this moment, Rick. <coughs> I can do that, I can do that. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to uh, Sergeant better, and uh, he is, well, he said that he would be um, following that up, and he was grateful for the video that was shown. So. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I spoke to you. And led about this specific issue as well. He said that he would go and speak to Revolution about the, the, the poor behaviour of unloading during busy time. It didn't sound as if the prosecution or strong word warning or anything like that was in the, in the offing. I think it was going to be a caution because it was seen as something that was done for a few times a year. So afraid, yeah, I would like strong, strong words that we have, but I don't think it's going to happen. So, um, we have two recommendations for the police to concentrate on going forward. Antisocial behaviour associated with rough sleeping, which has been discussed at high length this evening, and alcohol-related violence within the nighttime economy. Has anybody got any other issues? A different, it's it's um, just to pick up on what Sergeant Miss was saying about um, the um, high rates of crime uh, of vehicle theft from yep. builders vans, which um, while it probably doesn't affect any of the people in this room, I think is something that we should take seriously. And if that is on the increase, I think it would be sensible for um, that to um, remain. I mean, I imagine it will remain on the police priority in any case because it's, it's coming down. Okay. Um, so I suggest we take a 10 minute break now. Was that? Oh, we have to vote on that. Yeah. I beg your pardon. Is that in addition? So we have the first proposal is that we have um, concentrate on antisocial behaviour associated with rough sleeping. So does everybody agree with that, or does anybody want to? <laughs> Jim Missick was saying earlier, I, I'm a little bit concerned, I understand what he's saying, but a little bit concerned about the way he's described the role of the police. I hope in the 21st century we haven't got to such a harsh situation that our police are just there for enforcement. No, and, and, no we're not, we're not, trust and, me. And therefore, I think we should modify that recommendation to include, to continue to work with agencies, um, you know, basically combine it with, oh, yeah. with, with the prior team <coughs> before. Um, so it actually is addressing those with antisocial behaviour, but it's also working with them too. That, that's a fairly broad stroke discussion of what we do. It's the, it's the, it's the headline. It, yeah. Ben is very, very good, and um, he's not quite as eager as I make him out to be. And I, I, mean, I think that we should continue to have a police party for, given the fact that we've, we've um, had a number of questions around it this evening, uh, around antisocial use of the highway, if you like. Um, because I think yeah. it continues to be uh, a key area. I, I think what so. I, all I would say about that, Councillor, is I would like it to be, as you worded there, a wider road safety issue rather than a targeting any one individual yeah. kind of road use.
Thanks, Jerry. I, I did think that there would be a, a round of suggestions for priorities as well as voting on the, the ones that the police put forward. Uh, I support what Councillor Cohen said. I think the well, I, I hope that the, the language of coming to Cambridge and playing with our toys isn't used when speaking with, with homeless people. It, it's a bit of a, a patronising way to deal with such a, a sensitive issue. As I, as I said, that was when I spoke to a council officer. I, I don't talk to the public over that. <laughs> right, good. Yeah. And the, the antisocial driving issue, the examples of that might be the, the in, in, inappropriate use of junctions like Trumpington Road, trying to turn when there isn't room to turn and blocking the highway, blocking the cycle lanes, um, using mobile phones while driving. <laughs> it, it, there seems to be a lot of it going on. And I, I'm confident that these are the same people that, that go off and have crashes on motorways afterwards. If it's, if it's not stopped early on, then the behaviour continues. Right, I think we're going to have to reword this, um, these issues. Colin, did you want to make something? Um, on, the, on the vehicle one, I thought it was an important point to be picked up on just made by the by such a missing, which is that... Well, vehicle theft or...? The, the concentration on, on the misbehaviour by vehicles should oh, be right. on, on danger to the public. The, the priority should be the activities that are most dangerous to the public. In, in what I, call, I, I suppose the cyclists include dangers to themselves, but um, unfortunately motor vehicles are capable of a great deal more damage than motor bicycles are. Right, so it looks... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, we haven't... Um, we talked at length about the cycle, um, cycling in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. um, and that's not one of the recommendations. And I'm with Councillor Cairns on, I, I think antisocial behaviour associated with rough sleeping, the wording on that is really harsh, and that, something more proactive about, you know, supporting Cambridge Street Aid. Um, it's a more positive way. Mike Sorry, I can't hear you at all. Could we refer to it as problematic rough sleeping because not all the rough sleepers we deal with are problematic. Um, so the ones we tend to work closely with are, are the ones that are causing the most problems in the city, whether it's um, litter, toy, you know, go to the toilet and doorways and things like that. So maybe that would be right. an option. Um, so we've now got four four issues, if I'm correct. We've got problematic rough sleeping, we've got nighttime difficulties, we've got vehicle theft, and we've got inappropriate cycling. And or road use. Are you happy for me to have those rephrased and handed over? Or do you want to do it now? I need to do it now. Okay. Yes, why don't we take a break and come back and do it and we'll rephrase while you're taking a break. Lucy, did you want to add something before? I was just concerned about the, the phrase problematic rough sleeping. And that I think part, part of what we're trying to do is to, to make it clear in this objective that what we want the police to do is to help support people into um, alternative accommodation rather than deal with a law enforcement issue. Um, and our original, the original um, objective was to reduce, well, in, in some, it's got reduced antisocial behaviour, can't we? Rather than having, uh, dealing with, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong bit. I wondered if we could just have something about reducing rough sleeping, because actually what we want to do is to try and help these people into more suitable accommodation. Um, so I don't think we necessarily um, want to be referring to problematic rough sleeping. I think we want to just reduce the numbers overall. Um, by supporting people into different accommodation. So uh, I'm really concerned about the level of violent crime in the city centre and I don't think the proposal of um, nighttime problems really covers that. Can I suggest that when you set your priorities, councillors, you listen to what the inspector said and get some information on the degree of injuries. Now the inspector's given some ideas of where that can come from. It can come from the ambulance data, it can come from A&E. Uh, he's told you about that data. Why not get that here next time? 
Um, so instead of the violent crime statistics just going up by one when there's a major stabbing on Fair Street just 200 metres away from here, or where people are getting broken bones um, late in the evening, broken jaws you can read about um, in the Cambridge News, that kind of thing is just a plus one on your violent crime statistic, just the same as someone touching someone else and reporting it as a violent crime. So you can get much better information if you requested it. Um, and uh, So I think when, when you've got those kind of things, we should even have a sentence about the, the stabbing. Um, in, in a report to, um, to this meeting. And you could ask the police to, to communicate a lot better. When that stabbing occurred on Fair Street, the police said nothing about it for um, many hours. They didn't say anything in that evening when there was a rumour that, that, that the stabbing had taken place. You could ask them to communicate better to either reassure or warn people. Um, and I, th I think that would help people protect themselves um, from violent crime. So I think you could now, when you come back, you can make a real difference. You could prevent people from having injuries, um, which, um, which would be a substantial thing you could do this evening if, if you focused the um, police priorities in that way. I think the one that's proposed is very vague. <laughs> well, you could propose it, you're a councillor. We're talking about wording. Would you like to suggest wording? Yeah, I'm happy to take specifics around. So if we prioritise the issue of violent crime in the city centre, um, I'll make a note that what we mean by that is also greater data, greater detail around the data, so breaking it down by what is with injury, what's serious injury, what's without injury. Also, some of the data we have um, is now starting to specify certainly the A&E data around where the weapons were used, um, so, can say how many assaults were with a fist, with a knife, with a, you know, we, we can give you much more meaningful information, which I'm really keen to do, because the numbers are just numbers. Without the context, they tell you very, very little. So I'm, I'm happy to take that away as part of the priority. Yeah, but if it's not an, an additional administrative burden, it can be done easily and without additional costs, then that's... It's something that we already look at as, the, as part of the alcohol related violent crime group, so I can just bring that information to this meeting as well, and it will all be sanitised, so it's not an issue of data protection or personal information, it's uh, stuff that we can provide. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to adjourn at this point. We're going to try and reword and bring it back to you after the break in about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll take a vote.